Friends, welcome to worship here at North Caledonia United Church on the 25th of April and the 4th Sunday of Easter. We acknowledge that we need to work in Treaty 1 land, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are thankful for these first inhabitants, and we commit to working together towards justice, truth, and reconciliation. And we light the Christ candle. The light of Christ rises in glory, overcoming the darkness of sin and death. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. And let us pray together. Good shepherd of the sheep, by whom the lost are sought and guided into the fold, feed us and we shall be satisfied. Heal us and we shall be made whole. And lead us that we may be with you, for you are alive and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hear now the word of God. The first lesson is taken from Acts chapter 4, verses 5 to 12. The next day their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed let it be known to all of you and to all people of israel that this man is standing in good health uh, by the name of jesus christ of nazareth whom you crucified whom god raised from the dead this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which you must be saved. The second reading is from the epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 to 24. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and in action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. 
For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. chapter of the gospel according to John, beginning at the 11th verse. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The Gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O God, that in the written word and through the spoken word we may behold the living word, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. The fourth Sunday of Easter is often referred to as Good Shepherd Sunday, with the Gospel reading coming from some part of the 10th chapter of John, either verses 1 to 10 or 11 to 18, 
from 22 to 30. If we were able to sing, we would certainly include the Lord's My Shepherd in our service. And if all those years ago, Leo Mall had been given a different commission by the people of St. Jude's Anglican Church when they desired a memorial stained glass window, we might have an image of a lamb wrapped around the shoulders of the Good Shepherd gracing our sanctuary. Of course, we are grateful to the people of St. Patrick's and St. Jude's Anglican Church for their gift in 1982 of this Victory Through Jesus Christ window. A window made surplus when the St. Jude's building was torn down. Leo Mall windows are always precious possessions for any church building, and we are certainly blessed to have this one in our midst. Jesus the Good Shepherd is a powerful and reassuring image for Christian folk. It offers us a sense of comfort and of being cared for, of security and safety, of being a part of the family of God, though I guess the more accurate term if we are talking sheep is being a part of the flock. Another hymn we would have sung this day is The King of Love My Shepherd Is. With its evocative verse, perverse and foolish oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. A wonderful paraphrase of Psalm 23 by Henry William Baker. During my years at Silver Heights United Church, we would create our own bulletin covers with the help of Google Art. We would sort through the various depictions in paintings, stained glass, icons, etc. of whatever subject we were looking for. We knew for this Sunday we wanted a lamb a lamb safe in the arms of Jesus, which you might think would be a fairly simple image to find. We finally settled on a picture of a, of a rather contented little lamb, secure in the arms of the loving shepherd. That was after rejecting several other images, because in each case, the expression on the lamb's face seemed actually rather arrogant. If, if sheep can, in fact, be arrogant. It had that sense of, see where I am? See where you are? I am with the shepherd. In today's gospel, Jesus declares himself to be the good shepherd who is prepared to do everything for the sake of the flock, even to the point of losing his own life in the process. Jesus contrasts himself with the faithless the faithless hired hand, who runs away at the first sign of danger, running away and allowing great harm to come to the sheep. In John's Gospel, Jesus is quite clear that he is the shepherd of his fold and that those whom he calls to his flock, those who hear his voice, those who follow his teachings, will be kept safe through his divine power and grace. So we might ask the question, for the writer of John's Gospel, who are the others? Who are those who are, who are not a part of the flock? Those who are the faithless hired hands who really don't care for the people? Who is John referring to? We find the answer in the text that follows today's Gospel. Again, the Jews were divided because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is out of his mind. Why listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Throughout John's Gospel, we find the phrase, the Jews, used often. In the Easter story read just a few weeks ago, we heard the following. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace 
be with you. In the 12th chapter of John, we find this passage. When the great crowd of the Jews learned he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, because it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The Jews. It was convenient shorthand to lump together in one phrase any and all opposition to Jesus with just two words, the Jews. Soon after that, once the Christian church became dominant and powerful, the Jews became ready scapegoats for society's problems. Century by century, they were mistreated, deprived of rights and of property, denied freedom of religion and a safe place in society. Major theologians like Martin Luther railed against them. And we all know too well how the Jews fared during the Holocaust. A saying that once made the rounds was, how odd of God to choose the Jews. Later, someone much, rock, much wiser replied, but not so odd as those who choose a Jewish God but spurn the Jews. Anti-Semitism didn't begin with John's Gospel, but like many other passages of Scripture manipulated for wrong purposes, the seemingly negative connotations of the Jews in this Gospel have contributed to a distorted view of the Jews, rendering them as enemies to Christians, when that may not have been at all in the mind of the Gospel writer. Biblical scholarship sees John's use of the Jews as having a variety of meanings. The term can be referred to, can be used to refer to specific opponents of Jesus, or it can be used to refer to the entire people of the Jews. It needs to be understood in the context of the times. By the late first century, before this gospel was written, the Jewish authorities had expelled from the synagogues Jews who also believed in Jesus. This caused great offense and probably negatively influenced the Gospel writer. But even with that, it's also possible that John's use of the term the Jews was, was more descriptive than derogatory. You know, this, the way we use it for many other groups, such as the Canadians, the Americans, fill in the blank. At the heart of the issue, though, is the question of who Jesus really is. People of his day, Jewish people, but also others, were looking for a Messiah, a savior, a rescuer who would end Roman oppression, care for the widow and the orphan, and bring in a new age of peace and harmony. The Messiah might be a great military leader who could mobilize the armies of the righteous in a mighty cataclysmic battle against the powers of darkness. Others held that the Messiah was the Prince of Peace, who would usher in an age where there would be no war, no foreign occupation, no oppression. They saw the Messiah bringing in a time when, as Isaiah writes, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, Neither shall they learn war anymore. If we continued on in today's gospel, beyond the reading for this day, we would hear the question put to Jesus. How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus does not describe himself that way. His mission and ministry are broader than the traditional understandings of Messiah. His work is to bring all believers into the family and household of God, a global 
global rather than local approach. St. Paul understood it this way. The covenant God made with the Jewish people is eternal and not broken. Judaism is the trunk of the tree of faith to which, through Christ, Gentiles such as ourselves are grafted onto. We are honorary Jews, if you will. Without Judaism, without the Jews, Christianity would not have come to life. In the time of Jesus, some believed in him and some did not. Some trusted in the accounts of the resurrection and some called such things impossible. Some caught a fresh, life-giving vision of what a savior might look like, yet others could not see any change in their society or their personal life by this person who was being called a messiah. They just weren't convinced by him. And what held in the time of Jesus holds to this day. So some followed Jesus, and others perhaps thought about the points he made, but felt that he really wasn't for them. Such is the nature of faith and belief. What makes sense for one person doesn't necessarily hold for another. That is as true today as it was when Jesus walked the earth. Throughout human existence, the search goes on for meaning and purpose. How did we get here? How was the world created? Is there a power beyond what we can see? And is that power based in love? The Hebrew scriptures, so often misunderstood by Christians, speak of a loving father, slow to anger and quick to forgive. They are the base upon which Christianity is built, our foundation in knowing and loving God. When Jesus preached, his teachings were in line with Hebrew thought and practice. The diversity of God's wonderful creation suggests to me that God delights in all forms of worship sincerely offered, and in all acts of compassion and caring given to those in need. It is folly to think that there is only one true faith, one genuine religion, and everything else is false. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself is common to both Judaism and Christianity. And who are we to declare that those who don't think or act or sing or pray like us are not equally loved and cherished by God? Yes, Jesus did say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But that should not be understood or used as a way of excluding or denigrating or denying the truth of other beliefs. For me, just for me, perhaps for you, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But that is what he means to me, to us. And who are we to disregard another person's religious quest, which may be based on a completely different understanding of God? For us, Jesus is our Good Shepherd, the one who loves us, who gently lays us on his shoulder and brings us home. But surely our belief that God was in Christ does not in any way need to be in tension with or opposition to the beliefs of others who do not claim Christ as their own. God is revealed to those who seek the divine in different yet equally enriching and soul-satisfying ways. And who are we to say otherwise? I want to end by telling you the story of Pearl and Joe, who were members of my congregation at Forest Hill United Church in Toronto. 
They were a Christian Jewish couple, happily married for many years. Joel, who was Jewish, was an active and much loved member of our church at worship each Sunday. He contributed to the life of the congregation in many ways, including doing magic tricks for the children at Christmas parties. Occasionally, he was even known to appear as Santa Claus. Pearl, a Swedish farm girl from Saskatchewan, was also very active in the church um, and much loved. She was a devoted member of United Church Women and served on the church board amongst her other church involvements. On Jewish holidays, she would make traditional Jewish food for Joe. They didn't keep kosher, but she tried as much as possible to honor Joe's heritage. Their marriage was an example of mutual respect, devotion, and love, as well as a vibrant symbol of interfaith living that enriched both of them, their family, and the community around them. They were truly a blessing to all of us at Forest Hill United. Love God and love and forgive one another. The rabbis of old taught words certainly worth building a life upon. Amen. I invite you to turn to the words of a new creed that will make affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us, we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of wisdom and love, giver of all good things, we thank you for your loving kindness and for your constant care over all creation. We bless you for the gift of life, for your guiding hand upon us and your sustaining love within us. We thank you for friendship and duty, for good hopes and precious memories, for the joys that cheer us and the trials that teach us to trust in you. We bless you for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, for the living presence of your spirit, for your church, the body of Christ, for the ministry of word and sacrament, and all the means of grace. In our weakness, you are our strength. In our darkness, light. In our sorrows, comfort and peace. From everlasting to everlasting, you are our God. Loving God, you care for all your children, you know each one and hear each prayer, you know each house and see each need. Give peace and love to those who call upon you and receive us into the kingdom of your light. Bless your church, here and everywhere. Confirm your people in the faith of the gospel. Inspire them with love for your house, zeal in your service and joy in the well-being of your kingdom. Bless the whole world with peace. Kindle in the hearts of all people the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom the leaders of the nations, that your kingdom may advance until the earth be filled with the knowledge of your love. Bless with your comfort all who are in trouble or pain. Heal those who are sick, 
support those who are dying, console those who mourn, supply the wants of those who are in need. Be near to those who we now name, Peter Olick, Abe Hebert, Shelley Sinclair, Joan and Aaron. We also offer best wishes to Peter Weeb. And be with us now as we in silence offer our own prayers. Bless our homes, that love and joy may dwell there, and keep those who are absent from us within the protection of your love. And hear us as we gather these, our prayers and praises together, into the words that you taught us, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And as we prepare to leave this place, let us offer this song of blessing, Psalm 23, the setting is from Voices United. God is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall lack. You, God, make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside peaceful waters. You revive my spirit. You guide me in right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your rod and your staff are my comfort. You spread a table for me in the sight of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup is overflowing. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in God's house my whole life long. Christ, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life for the sheep, Draw you and all who hear his voice to be one people within one fold. And the blessing of God, the Holy Trinity, be with you now and always. Amen.